have you ever seen something on your plant and you're just like, is this something I need to be worried about? Or is this something that naturally occurs on the plant? Let's look at some plant structures and see why they exist, why they're important and what they might mean for you growing plants in your house or in your collection. Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel House Planty Goodness and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today I wanted to dive into a bit more of a scientific, a bit more of a geeky topic which is plant structures and I'm going to be a bit all over the place for this video but I wanted to cover some of the ones that might worry a few people, especially if you're maybe just getting into plants or maybe even if you've owned plants for a while but you've not had a plant that had this type of structure. And a lot of these structures that we're going to be talking about today are evolutionary adaptations that these plants have had to kind of create for themselves in order to give them an advantage. Think about something growing on a jungle floor it's going to be competing with a lot of other things, let alone pests, let alone predators, let alone kind of things like animals eating it, all of these things. It still is doing its most as to establish itself, make itself grow as much as possible and give itself its best possible life. So a lot of these structures are the way that these plants have to kind of essentially interact with their environment to give them that edge. It's really, really cool, actually. And the reason why I thought I'd do this video is because I had a plant when I was first starting off and I was like, what is growing on its stem and why is it turning like this? Has it got mold? Or is this like some form, is this like I'd never seen scale? Is this scale? And I wasn't too sure of it. But it ended up just being a natural part of that plant structure. And there's a good reason for it to be there. But without further ado, let's look at some of these plant structures. I'm kind of looking around my space and trying to see is there anything with this type of plant structure i don't think there's anything i can easily grab i do know of a plant that i've got upstairs in one of the bathrooms that is exhibiting this and i will add a picture of it here or even a video depending on what i can get basically and it will kind of highlight what this is and essentially what i want to be talking about first is corking on the plant stems and this is the bit that I was talking about earlier on, which is something that when I was first starting off, I'm just like, is it scale or is this something that I need to be worried about? No, this is a natural part of the plant. And essentially for a lot of the house plants that we've got, their stems usually remain kind of like usually a smooth green structure. It's, it's kind of quite vegetative essentially in the way that it looks. Very rarely do you get house plants that start looking a bit like the bark of a tree. But corking is essentially just that. Essentially, it is the cells around the growing stem or the stem of the plant, usually lower down, very rarely, for very few plants, will you ever see it going all the way to the top, but you can usually see it lower down on the stem where you start getting this kind of browning, harder, it kind of looks a bit more textured appearance. And that is because these plants, these cells on the outside of that plant stem are hardening off. And can you guess why, essentially? It's very similar to why the trunk of a tree is as rigid as it is. It helps to keep that plant structure. It's helping to keep it upright. It kind of protects it a bit as well from elements from anything else around it. You would imagine if something's got something that looks like a cork or it looks something like a trunk of a tree around its stem, what pest is going to be able to go through that? Even the dreaded thrips that we all worry about. Have you ever seen something like a thrip on a plant that has got something like corking on it? Another example of plants that would sometimes get corking on it, and I think if, the, if I'm not mistaken, the example I want to be showing you here is going to be my philodendron early marks Variegata, I'm pretty sure. But I've also noticed this on, I'm looking at it, and again, I cannot pick that plant up, unfortunately, but the Philodendron pylora ends. And interestingly, with the Philodendron pylora ends, which is the one that looks a bit like a Tesla plant, so it looks like a T, it's got the two 
kind of leaflets and the one long leaflet in the middle. That is always compared to the Philodendron Holtonianum, which I think is the plant that people call the Tesla plant. The main structural difference between the two different plants that have got those T-shaped leaves is the Pelora ens is, and I was doing, I found this out when I was doing the original research before I got that plant, is that the Pelora ens will always, always get corking on the stem and the Holtonianum generally won't. And OMG, is that the case, basically? It's like the Holtonianum's almost the entirety of the stem all the way up to the growing tip is corked, basically. Whilst the, so the Pelora ens is the one that's got the corking. The Holtonianum doesn't have any corking on it. So there is this, and I think apparently, I think the Holtonianum, is meant to be the slightly fastest growing one of the two, but for me, the Pelora ends is faster. Bizarre. But you do get this a lot. You'll get this a lot of times for the Monsteras. You might notice some of that corking on the Monsteras. Monstera tends to be the one plant that people look at and see corking for the first time because they're actively looking for something to be wrong with that plant so they can go, oh, what do I do? I'm trying to baby this plant. It's kind of a natural part of what the plant will do in order to adapt to its environment. It might just be giving itself a bit more rigidity, all of these things. So it's nothing to worry about, but it's really interesting to be aware of what corking is. The next one I do want to talk about, and I do have an example, is, and this is a particularly bad example. Can you can you see that this varicosum is getting way too much light, or it was in the summer, the leaves are going smaller because I'm not putting it on a moss pole. Anybody who has seen a video that I did on the varicosum will understand that this is the last remaining varicosum I've got in my care. I don't care. But can you see these brown or crispy bits that are happening around the kind of node and where the leaf is? These originally were nice and green and smooth, and they are something called leaf catafil or a leaf sheath, basically. So when some of the plants that we own, they emerge, they will usually have that green element, that catafil around the leaf. And it is there predominantly to protect that newest leaf because it is so, so tender from mechanical knocks, so if it was in the jungle from an animal walking past it and like kind of trying to snap it, all of these things, pests sometimes, and I know it can be annoying with caterpillars because if you're anything like me and you've ever had any form of pests, a lot of the pests have figured it out and they go between the newest leaf and the caterpillar and they will sit there and damage the leaf before you've even had a chance to look at it or even see it unfurled. And you're just like, why is this leaf already problematic? It's only just opened. It's because the pests got between the new leaf and the caterpillar. Now, before you go running off and trying to take the caterpillar off an emerging leaf, where you can't even see the leaf yet, don't do that. That's a whole other host of problems because that caterpillar, when it's in its green form, it's also helping keep a lot of that moisture in on that leaf because again, it's super, super sensitive. If you've ever had a chance where you've accidentally or on purpose taken a plant out of its caterpillar, I'm looking at every single person who has owned a philodendron pink princess here. <laughs> I see you. I was one of you. Still am one of you. But sometimes when you remove that leaf out of a caterpillar, you might get that leaf going crispy, really, really quickly. If you even, even if you don't do any damage, any mechanical damage to the leaf as you're trying to take it out of the caterpillar, it might go fully crispy like that, basically, because you've taken away that kind of moisture collar that it's got on it and exposed it to potentially much drier air, basically. So that is something to bear in mind. But the caterpillars are there to serve a purpose when the leaf is emerging. They are not there to serve a purpose after it's emerged. So at that point, I would say, depending if you want to, you don't have to. It's more for two reasons that you might want to remove dried up caterpillars. Cosmetic being one, you just don't like seeing something brown and crispy on the plants that you've kind of babied all the way through. Or, and arguably for me, that's more important, is, oh, you might even be able to see some corking there. If I hide my face, and you see it just ever so slightly, that kind of more grainy texture that you've got there, that's the emergence of kind of corking that's happening there. But the big reason why you'd want to remove, oh, and I actually have an example here to show you. 
So I had that Caterfield on there. Let me bring this in a bit closer so you might be able to see if I kind of close, hide it over my face. Can you see that white speckle in there? That's a mealy bug. So the reason why you'd want to remove some of these caterpillars on your plants, especially the dried up ones. So unfortunately, what we were talking about before, the, the kind of the more kind of fresh and green the caterpillar is, it's still serving a purpose. You want to remove that. If you were trying to remove that caterpillar to make sure that the pests don't go in between it, you might still end up irreparably damaging the plant, either because you knocked it or cut it or all of these things or it might be exposed to the drier air faster, so it might crisp up. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword there, but at the point where it's crisped out and the leaf has fully emerged, do try to remove them if you can, because that is a huge place where, I don't think I've ever seen the thrip in there, but mealybugs 100% in there, and also a lot of the time spider mites. So these are places where these pests can go and hide and proliferate basically because you just like, I've taken off all the mealybugs I can't see anymore why why did, am I still seeing it coming back other than just the life cycle of the specific pest it might be because they are hiding in plain sight behind those caterpillars basically so just make sure that you are checking even if you want to keep them on just do a quick check to see if there's any pest behind it and that is a good way of being proactive with your pest management as well so let's have a look at something that's Plant favorite for a lot of people, basically, especially if you're looking to propagate. This is the Philodendron Heleniae subspecies Heleniae with its massive Hadley leaves. And the structures I want to talk about, and I know everybody else has spoken about this to death, is this. It's the aerial roots, but not just the aerial roots. So obviously, a lot of people have talked about aerial roots. They're really great for propagation because it gives you a starting point when you're starting. So if you take a cutting here, there's the growing tip, which is probably going to come from the growth point right there. You might be able to see it. And then you've got the roots and the, the arrow roots are giving you something that you can put into a growing media to then propagate this if you're taking a cutting. They are there predominantly, but not only to provide support for the plants. So if this is against the tree, this might be digging into the bark of the tree and helping to kind of stabilize this plant. It gives it more of a place to anchor itself. A lot of the aerial roots, they are still roots. They can still absorb both moisture and nutrients from that tree that it might be attaching to. A lot of the times in a household environment, we might be doing something like a moss pole in this situation. And yes, there is a strong, strong point to have for something like an arrow root. Now, I'll show you the example of the varicosum again, because I want to show you something else. And a lot of people have always been asking about this. Even I had to do some extra research to find this. And as far as I'm aware, so again, I'll bring this up so you can see. So the varicosum, these are the more traditional area roots that were kind of like big, thick roots that we're used to seeing around the node. But can you see all of those little roots that are happening along the stem? I was sitting there going, is that called something different? Is that still an aerial root? And as far as I can tell from my research, these are still aerial roots. But what you might be able to understand, and if you look at them, and this is again, just things that I'm assuming, these aerial roots that you can see here, can you see the slight bit of fuzziness on them? Those would be the ones that would attach to the potential tree trunk, but because they've got that fuzziness that's happening around those aerial roots, the same way that you might get fuzziness and kind of little uh, rootlets that are happening off the main roots in the soil or in the growing media, these are going to be the ones that I'm assuming are going to be much better adept to both absorb moisture and absorb nutrients for this plant. But a lot of the times when you look at some of these other roots, or at least this is something that I've noticed, they're a lot smoother, they're a bit more bumpy. These will be the ones that will just dig into something like the tree trunk that would be here to give it support. And predominantly, I would imagine these roots that are growing along the stem rather than closer to a node, their predominant role, again, I'm assuming here, if there's a botanist out there that knows that I'm talking rubbish, please do let me know. I would love to be wrong with this one. I would assume these are predominantly there just to anchor that plant into that tree trunk and give it that stability. 
So a lot of the times what this might mean to me, if I'm seeing something like this, and you can see there isn't even a janky support stick on this, a lot of the times when I'm seeing the plant readily give this out, and I can see that the leaves have got smaller and smaller and smaller, to me, this is almost like this plant is screaming out to me to go, I need something to attach to. Give me a plank or give me a moss pole or give me a janky support stick. I need something to help give me some stability so I can start growing larger leaves, basically. Think about it. It's kind of like reaching out to kind of attach to something. So that kind of makes sense. By the way, just before anybody says, I'm not going to give this a moss pole because I just don't care, basically. I have heard you, and I can't believe I'm actually going to say this based on other videos. I might try another varicosum other than just, I think, the, the Icinii, the one that I had. I'm doing that. You should try a different type. It might be different. <sighs> I will see and see how I get on, basically. I'm, I'd be open to trying that, especially seeing as... Some of the research that I was doing for another video that's coming out this week, I don't know if that's coming out first or this one's coming out first, but when I talk about altitude in plants, I didn't realize that the different varicosums that are adept to different altitudes as well. So I think that might be an interesting one for me to look into in a bit more detail if I'm going to get another varicosum. Uh, but yeah, so that is certain types of structures that you would get on the stems. The other one that a lot of people don't necessarily talk about, and I don't think I've got any of these plants in my care currently. I used to have one, so I'll add it onto here. A lot of the cissuses or the cissusi, I don't know, but um, I don't know what the plural one is on that one. But uh, so the cissus amazonica, the cissus discolor, if I'm not mistaken. Another one that's not usually considered as a house plant, you can, if I'm not mistaken, grow this as a house plant, but the passion flower, the passion fruit, but the passion flower, these plants all have tendrils. And tendrils, again, as far as I can see, kind of on the more biological side of things, they're not actually roots. They are kind of a form of either a stem or a leaf that's predominant structure is there to help wrap around something to, again, give that plant's stability. That, however, tendrils, as far as I can tell, are not there. They can't absorb moisture or nutrients. They're not like aerial roots in that respect. They are there predominantly. So if something is growing up something, they can wrap around it and make sure that, that plant is held tight. And it is true. And if you've ever grown something like a cissus, and the cissus plants that we see as house plants, they are very closely related if not in the same family, if I'm not mistaken, as the grape plant. And if, if anybody's seen grape vines, literally grape vines vining and growing I'm from the med, so I see this a lot when I'm from, they do have these tendrils and they really do attach and stay on there really, really strong. So that is a structure that a plant will have in order for it to attach to something. So that is something that's always important to remember. Another way that some plants might attach is not just necessarily by the stem, or by the tendrils or the aerial roots. And this is, I'm looking at a lot of Hoyas here. The plant stem itself will wrap around something. And that's what gives it the structure because it's kind of basically lassoing itself around something that it can kind of then hold onto. Next bit that I want to talk about is something that we'll see a lot more in anthuriums. And let me see if I can pick up an anthurium and show you. I'm using an anthurium as an example here because it's the most obvious way that you can see it. So this is the Anthurium arisimoides has just got a new leaf and it's doing a super well, although it is covered in mealybugs. So I do need to deal with that. <sighs> ah, the winter time. But I'll bring it up so hopefully you might be able to see. Can you see that slight swelling that is happening there between the stem and the actual leaflets itself? That, if I'm not mistaken, is called the granaculum, I think. I might be wrong. I will add it at the very top there. But essentially what that does is it helps with phototropism. And phototropism is just a very big scientific word to basically imply so something that you've probably noticed on your plants, but you didn't necessarily know what it was called. It's when you get a plant's leaves turning towards the light. And let me see if I've got an example that I can show you here. And I did go through this on my Anthurium is Merrill Dance video, this leaf here that's now pointing upwards 
is because we're now in the winter months. In the summer, this was pointing downwards because it was getting a lot of light coming in that way. Now that it's in the winter and it's more cloudy in the mornings, it's not getting that light hitting it there. It's getting the light coming in from above the conservatory. So what that granaculum, I think it is, is doing is that it is kind of there as a bit of an elbow. So it's kind of moving that leaf towards where the light is in order for it to get the maximum amount of light. So with this plant, this is a bad example. It was a good example of that kind of elbow structure that I was talking about is a bad example because this is getting a lot of downwards light. So all of the leaves are pointing up. If this didn't have any downward light and it was getting light coming in from here, from say a window, what would might happen is that granaculum would move the leaves to be kind of pointing towards that light level. So that is really, really cool in terms of the structure. And again, you can see how that's an evolution and adaptation because let me give you a kind of more of a real world example. Say for instance, this plant here is growing somewhere close to the jungle floor, maybe not right on the jungle floor, but it's getting light from above. Maybe there's a tree branch that has broken and it's getting a bit more light from here. So it's used to having all of its foliage pointing upwards. But say one or a couple of trees, maybe there was a big storm and they've basically dropped and cut themselves or something's come across and blocked some of that light there. What this plant then needs to do is find where the nearest light source is now that that main light source that it was used to getting from the top and it might be somewhere here there might be kind of a gap between some of the trees or maybe even the fallen trees that have fallen through to then turn around so it's maximizing the amount of light that it's getting it might even move the entirety of its growing stem. And I don't want to do that on the newest leaf, but it might even move this element here. It will try to, and this is the thing that's really interesting with plants, they will try to be as efficient with their plant movements as possible because it takes an awful lot of energy for a plant to even move a leaf that's here to a leaf that's here. But if you can imagine, even if the leaf was here, this is the petiole, this is the leaf, and it drops it down, but then that's not enough if that petiole then needs to move out so it's even closer, that's a much bigger movement than this would have been basically. So it's something to bear in mind when you're looking at some of your plants because it's sitting there going, why isn't it growing, blah, 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 blah. I haven't done anything different. It might be that the season has changed and that leaf movement that might have been enough if there was a small fluctuation in the light might not be enough and then the whole plant needs to tilt all of its leaves towards there and that's a much more energy kind of heavy movement for the plant to do so guess what that means if the plant has to do all of its energy to move the leaf towards the light guess where the energy isn't going to be going towards new growth basically so especially in a period of the year where something like winter when maybe there's is even less light or less daylight hours there's only so much energy that the plant can utilize and if it all it can do is move those leaves towards the light and just maintain its kind of current status quo in terms of foliage but it still gets the light that it needs to get. That's what it's gonna do. It's not gonna try and push out a new leaf, which is also gonna be something that's energy intensive and then not move the leaves to get more light. Does that make sense? It's kind of like, it's a bit counterintuitive for it to do it. So it's very interesting how plants are very efficient with how they will do, well, how they will utilize their movement. They need to, to basically expend as little as possible in terms of energy for the maximum amount of gain. And it makes sense because there's only so much energy that they can utilize. And looking at some other plant structures that are specialized in the plant in terms of its environment could be something like thorns on cacti. It essentially minimizes evaporation. Believe it or not, if I'm not mistaken, the thorns on a cactus are basically a form of leaf. It wouldn't photosynthesize from its thorns. It's kind of getting it from that main body that it has, essentially. But those are 
modified leaves essentially because it means it can minimize evaporation and it also acts as protection from potential animals that they might be wanting to get to its kind of juicy core essentially. So that is an interesting one to kind of bear in mind and that's why those plants, specifically something like a cactus, has evolved in that way. Then you might look at things like tuberous plants. So plants like the alocasia or the colocasia, they've got tubers. You might even look at things like the calatheas, where they'll have little kind of potato-like structures within their rooting system. It might not be a main tuber like you might get an alocasia or a colocasia, and potential reason for an alocasia or a colocasia to be keeping that much moisture in those tubers, because essentially what that's what they are. They are a reservoir of water and nutrients, I think. But essentially, it's because those plants are very water hungry. So they want to make sure that they've got water at all given times, because a lot of that water is also what's creating the pressure that's needed to keep those massive leaves upright, basically. Now, the interesting things with something like a calathea, and everybody would just like, always try to keep them moist. And you just, you always kind of look at this kind of going, oh, this has got little tubers inside. Why am I trying to keep this moist as much as possible? Because again, think about the movements that we were talking about before and how much energy it takes for the plants to kind of move something as simple as a leaf potentially. So again, this is another example of phototropism. This is a different example. So instead of it reaching for the light, you can see it bleached out because it was getting too much light and it also moved the foliage away from the light so that it doesn't cause it damage, something like leaf burn or sun damage essentially on the leaf. So that's another way that that kind of join between the petiole and the leaf can work is to move it away from the light as well. So if you start seeing your plant where its leaves are pointing away from the light, so say the window is here, might be an idea to move it slightly further back because it's getting too much and it's trying to shield itself and protect itself from too much light. Now, something like the tubers that we were talking about before, if you think about anything along the lines of the calatheas, the prayer plants in general as a category essentially, what do they do more so than any other plant? They have that movement that happens on their leaves throughout the day and night time, which is why a lot of times they talk about prayer plants because their leaves move up and they look a bit like hands in prayer. That is very, very energy intensive. Them having to move that foliage every day by that much. It might not seem like an awful lot, but it is a lot of energy that it needs in order to do that daily. So something like those tubers in their root system are great energy stores and great kind of like water stores because again, it means that they've got that water available to them at any given time so they can still create that movement that they need to create. Another thing that's an adaptation that a lot of plants would have is something, not necessarily variegation, but have you ever heard of something called a blister variegation? I'll see if I can add an example here. My Piper sylvaticum, if I'm not mistaken, is one of them. Oh, actually, do I have any down there? Ugh. No, <laughs> nothing that's easily movable, but I am talking about plants that are silver. And what that usually is, is between the layers of that leaf cell, there's usually bubbles of air. And essentially what this creates is almost like that plant or that leaf has got a bit of an umbrella over itself and just kind of going, I am nice and secure. All my sensitive bits are underneath this air bubble. So there's less light that can kind of come through and harm my foliage. A lot of the times what you might get sometimes with not all plants that have got this blister variegation, the silvery plants, but actually if you move them into very, very, very low light levels, barring the fact that they all struggle a bit to kind of like get the amount of light that it needs, but what you might then start seeing, and I've got an example, and I'll see if I can add a picture here of my Plowmanii, which will have those silvery strips, some people might call it variegation, it's not quite that basically, on the foliage, I have since moved it to another location, and this was my most silvery of my two Plowmanii. Trying to look at the other one. Yeah, this was the most silvery one. I moved it to a very low light level because that's the only place I could give it. The leaves are now almost entirely green, a deep green at that as well. So they're, they're, the deeper the green there is on the foliage, 
the more adept it is to get as much of that light in low light situations as possible. So that is always something to bear in mind and is how the plant has adapted itself to protect itself from the light. But a lot of the time, some of these plants with blister irrigation can kind of minimize or almost entirely get rid of their blister irrigation if the light levels are not there. Because at that point, it doesn't need to protect itself from the light anymore. It needs to make sure that it doesn't have any of that protection. That umbrella is gone. So we can get the most amount of light and the most amount of kind of energy coming through from the light levels. So what does it mean to all of us when we're caring for our plants? It just means that being aware of some of these structures so it doesn't worry you that your plant has got corking. It's kind of a natural part of its process. Some plants will do it regardless of anything else. Some plants, it might be an indication if you're not, if it's not a plant that would normally get corking on it. So again, I'm looking at the Philodendron pilarens, which is meant to get corking and it gets it at the drop of a hat. But some other plants that might not be used to getting quite as much corking and all of a sudden you're seeing a lot of it, it might just be because it's just like, oh, it needs an extra bit of humidity and stop being lazy and give it a moss pole or give it a janky support stick. It needs something to keep itself upright and it's usually when it's slightly bigger plants and they and I guess this is a small plant but it's when they start getting too heavy in order to they're, they're putting too much energy to try to keep themselves upright and not enough energy in their foliage so they are making sure that they're corking around that growing stem in order to give them that rigidity so they don't have to keep pumping energy into doing that basically then you've got things like the caterpillars which are there predominantly to kind of watch out for the leaves and there's not an awful lot that you could do to kind of not have that for the plant it is part of that natural process the corking you might be able to minimize it a bit if you do give it something that will provide it with some rigidity so it doesn't have to keep doing that all the time again not always and then tendrils making sure that it's got something to climb on have you see have you ever seen a plant that needs to tendril out and you don't give it anything to climb on it is the saddest thing in the world it's like the little pathetic kind of droppy thing going i need something to climb on and you're not doing anything for me so give it something to climb on and then being aware of that movement that might be happening on that granaculum again i might I'm very very sure that i'm saying that word wrong or it's an entirely different word but i would have had to put it the correct one somewhere um that takes a lot of energy so anything that's energy inefficient isn't good for the plants continued fast growth because it's doing all of these other things in order to just maintain the status quo and not focusing on keeping itself growing. But I think that's everything I wanted to cover on today. Some familiar topics that we've talked about a bit more, some newer topics, some topics that we went into a bit more detail. Did I miss anything? Is there something that you're just like, oh yeah, there, there needs to be more chat about this specific plant structure? Would you want me to do another one of these videos? And if so, what plant structures would you like me to talk about? You don't need to know the scientific name. Just tell me it's this thing on the plant somewhere here and I'll hopefully figure out what you mean. And we can dive into why that happens with that specific plant as well. But yeah, all of these things are to say that nature provides us with the information that we need in order to give our plants the best in terms of how they grow, how fast they grow, how well they grow. Knowing the structures and what they mean to the plant and what it might mean in terms of its growth is the language that we can understand from the plant because everybody always keeps talking about expressive plants and they're just like, yeah, the, the peace lily will throw itself like it will faint when it needs more water or the same with the phytonia as well and then you water it and it will do that and it's an expressive plant. I would go a step further and say most plants are expressive. We just need to know the language to understand it in, basically. So it is one of those things that paying attention to some of these structures or how some of these things function on a plant usually gives you very quick indicators as to what's happening, what might be wrong, what might be going well as well, and how do you adapt to it, basically. But yeah, hopefully you've all enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon and I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.